Um, I should start off by saying it's a pleasure to see so many of you uh, for this uh, Northern Province lecture uh, this evening. You, um, those of you who've been to these lectures before may have been expecting my colleague, um, my partner at Wrigley's, who is Lizzie Wilson. She, I think, is in, on the call on the Zoom meeting, but she's uh, unable to host this evening due to some uh, family issues. Uh, so I've been asked to step in. Um, I would have worn a short shirt and tie, uh, a, a suit and a jacket and tie, had I uh, been given as a warning, but um, I hope you'll forgive me uh, for a degree of uh, informality. Um, it is a shame we can't be meeting in person. Um, ordinarily, these lectures would be held in the uh, Dyson office in, in Leeds, but on a dark, dank, cold evening such as this, this uh, you might be quite glad that you didn't have to leave the house and, and, and travel distance. Um, and it's really good as well, I should say, to see so many of you from uh, the province of Canterbury. Um, I'm sure it's much nicer down there at the moment. You're much nearer to the tropics than we are up north. So um, it's good to see so many of you taking the interest in what I'm sure will be a really interesting uh, topic for our lecture this evening. Um, it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce Louise. She's going to talk about her first year as the uh, provincial registrar for York. Um, I took the opportunity earlier to look at her profile on her website, which tells, tells us what her interests are. And I was delighted to see is a both, she's both a keen campanologist, a ring beller, and also somebody who appreciates uh, Yorkshire real ale. Uh, and in my book, that makes you pretty suit, uh, suitable for most roles within the church. So um, I think that's, um, that's welcome. And uh, Louise, when we come out of lockdown, I'd welcome the opportunity uh, to, to travel any, to any church you might mention to engage in a combination of those activities. Um, I'm not going to say anything more about Louise for fear that I might actually uh, encroach upon what she is about to share with us. So I'm going to ask Louise to unmute herself uh, and I will, uh, she'll probably want to uh, share her screen and then she will uh, talk to us for a wee while. Uh, the last thing I would say is if there are questions, please do put them in the chat room as we go along and we will try and uh, bring those together to uh, ask on your behalf at the end. Over to you, Louise. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, can everyone hear me? Is that okay? Can someone give me a thumbs up? Excellent, thank you. And is my screen shared? Is that working too? Yeah, excellent, thank you. And thank you for that introduction, Ian. Um, unfortunately, not drinking much real ale at the moment with the lockdown, so um, we're having to manage without that, but um, thank you for your kind words. Um, so this is my first time lecturing on Zoom. I thought rather than you all looking at a big picture of my face for the next 40 minutes or so, I would have some um, nice pictures and slides to show you instead. So I've been asked to talk about my first impressions of a new provincial registrar. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just talk first of all about the role of the provincial registrar for those who don't know what we actually do. Um, and then I'm going to reflect on my first year in office. Um, so I'm just going to show you this lovely picture. One of the things I love about being the, the, the registrar in York is, is walking to the Minster for the different services that I have to attend, walking there and, 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 and going in there at, at, at a time when it's quiet um, and being able to, to robe and, and, and get ready for the services. So I do like pictures of York Minster. You're going to see a few of those tonight. So my role as registrar, um, I am appointed by the Archbishop of York, as you'd expect. Um, the qualifications for the provincial registrar are the same as for diocesan registrars. So um, I have to have a general legal qualification, which in my case is a solicitor. I have to be learned in ecclesiastical laws and the law of the land. And the Archbishop must be satisfied that I'm a communicant. Um, under the canons, I am required to take um, oaths and subscribe to a declaration like diocesan registrars and like members of the clergy. Um, so that comes from canon law, canon G4. 
Um, I'm paid a statutory fee, which is set out in the annual fees order. So those of you who are diocesan registrars will be familiar with the annual fees order that sets out the, the fixed fee for the year. Um, so I'm paid by the church commissioners because it, it's, it's an expense of the Archbishop of York. But unlike diocesan registrars, my duties are not set out in the order. Um, and I had a quite an interesting time when I took over trying to find out exactly what it is I'm supposed to do. So the main elements of my role. Firstly, I am legal secretary to the Archbishop of York in his metropolitical provincial jurisdiction. I'm registrar of the Court of Chancery of York, the Court of the Vicar General of York, and other provincial courts and tribunals. I act for the Archbishop and the Vicar General in the legal processes on the resignation and appointment of bishops in the Northern Province. So that includes confirmation of election of diocesan bishops in the Vicar General's court. More of that later. I participate in consecration services for new bishops in the Northern Province. I um, work with um, the Southern Provincial Registrar in training and induction of new bishops in ecclesiastical law matters. We've done quite a few of those even during, during lockdown by Zoom. I act as scrutinising registrar on CDMs against bishops and in the Northern Province and against the Archbishop of Canterbury, um, advising the Archbishop of York and his chaplain on particular cases and on more general CDM matters. I'm registrar of the Convocation of York. I advise bishops in the Northern Province at a provincial level, so perhaps on matters that either that the, their own diocesan registrars can't advise on or perhaps it's not appropriate for them to advise on. So recent examples are um, cathedral visitations or perhaps uh, quite sensitive safeguarding matters um, in, involving bishops, for example. I attend the general synod sessions relating to legislation and business that could lead to legislation. So if you've ever had the pleasure of watching general synod on um, online, I usually sit at, at, at the back um, behind the Archbishop. I have to deal with overseas permissions. So that is assessing and processing applications for permission under the overseas and other clergy ministry and ordination measure. Um, I also advise and process applications for issuing Canon C4 faculties. So that's the faculty under Canon C4 that is required for um, someone who wishes to be ordained, who um, has been divorced and their um, former partner is still living. I support and advise registrars ac across the Northern Province, including organizing training sessions. And I also act as a voice for registrars in national discussions. And I'm also appointed to a variety of committees and other bodies. This has been quite, um, quite interesting, the different committees and bodies that I'm appointed to, because what seems to happen is I keep getting emails from people telling me I've got a committee meeting coming up that I wasn't actually aware I was on. So I'll go through what I think is a complete list. Um, firstly, I'm a member of the Clergy Discipline Commission. So that's the body constituted under the CDM which is responsible for ensuring the disciplinary arrangements, for ensuring that the disciplinary arrangements under the CDM work as fairly and effectively as possible. And um, that's chaired by the president of tribunals and I'm an elected member of that. Um, so an example was we did have a meeting earlier this week where we discussed amended guidance on penalties and proposed changes to the code of practice as well as other matters. Um, I sit on the Fees Advisory Commission as an elected member, so that is the organisation that makes recommendations for the fees for legal offices in the Church of England. So when I was talking earlier about the annual fees order that sets um, the registrar's uh, fees for the year, that's the commission that, that, that looks at that and makes proposals. So those proposals are made to General Synod and, and, and they're approved by General Synod. I'm on the Legal Advisory Commission, which gives advice on legal matters of general interest to the church, um, which will be referred to it by bodies such as the Archbishop's Council, um, General Synod and, and its different bodies, the church commissioners, 
diocesan, diocesan clerical and lay office holders. Um, I'm an ex officio member of, of, of that commission. Um, you may have read the recent debates about using individual cups for communion wine, and, and the LAC has had produced a, a, an opinion on that um, some time ago. So that's the sort of thing we look at. Then I also sit on the rule committee as one of two diocesan registrars nominated by the two archbishops. So I, I sit on it and John Reese, the, um, my Southern counterpart sits on it as well. Um, it's chaired by the Dean of, Ar of the Archers and Auditor, Maura Gallis, um, and we make rules under a variety of different ecclesiastical law measures. Um, the most recent um, work that we undertook was proposing changes to the clergy discipline rules with a view to reducing delays and streamlining the process. So that's the sort of work that we do there. I'm also an ex officio member of the Executive Committee of the Ecclesiastical Law Association, which um, is the, I don't know, perhaps the sister association of the ELS, which is the association for, for diocesan registrars across the country. I think that's everything until another email pops up telling me that I should be attending another meeting that I wasn't aware of. So that's the work that I undertake as provincial registrar. Um, I've been asked to reflect on the last year, which of course has been a very strange year. I was formally appointed on the 4th of February last year. So if you think back, we were just um, starting to get worried about coronavirus at that point. One of my, the reason I was appointed on the 4th of February was so that I could undertake one of my first formal duties last year, which was to attend General Synod during the week of um, the 10th of February. That, is, that General Synod meeting is probably the only duty that I have undertaken as provincial registrar that followed the normal rules. So it was held as usual in Church House in London, in Westminster. I attended most of the sessions. I got a bit worn out by the end. I didn't realize that most people spend half the time at General Synod um, drinking coffee in the coffee room. Um, so next time I'll know what to do, but I attended most of the sessions so that I, so I, know, I know a whole, whole lot about the workings of General Synod now and what goes on. Um, I met um, colleagues from different dioceses that I work with, different bishops, other ecclesiastical lawyers, we did exciting things like um, shared coffee, lunch and dinner together. We mixed, we shook hands, we embraced, we took communion in both kinds. We sang hymns in the, um, in the, main, the, the, the main room where General Synod's held. So it was an absolute delight when I look back at it compared to um, what's happened since. Within six weeks, the world had changed and I was running the provincial registry from the spare bedroom in my home in West Yorkshire that is now to all intents and purposes my office. I hope you'll notice um, our chairman's weighty tome and the great use I've put it to over the course of the last, almost the last year, um, propping up my laptop during Zoom meetings. It has been extremely useful. Thank you, Mark. Um, so I've decided that the second part of my talk today is going to look at the effects of the current pandemic um, and, and those effects on the life of a provincial registrar and to look at ecclesiastical law through the lens of COVID-19. I'm going to look at three particular areas. Firstly, um, the, initial hour, the initial advice that I was involved in coordinating and, and, and getting involved in right at the beginning of the pandemic um, looking at how dioceses and parishes could operate virtually. Secondly, I want to look at consecrations during the pandemic. And then finally, I'm going to talk about the confirmation of election of the 98th Archbishop of York, Stephen Cottrell. So it's a virtual. One of the functions of provincial registrar is to take a lead on legal matters on behalf of all diocesan registrars. And over the course of the year, particularly when our churches were closed, numerous legal issues arose. Different dioceses have found different ways of dealing with these problems, but generally amongst registrars, there is a preference to try to find a common approach where possible. 
One of the biggest issues has been what can and cannot be done virtually. This first issue arose in connection with licensing clergy. Although our churches were closed, the life of the church had to go on. We had clergy due to move from one benefice to another. Parishes needed their new clergy more than ever. And so the question came up early on in the first lockdown as to whether or not clergy could be licensed by Zoom. A number of diocesan registrars and bishops took the pragmatic view initially that it was perfectly possible for clergy to take their declarations and oaths and to be licensed in this way. And many proceeded on this basis from the start. Other registrars were less convinced of the legality of this approach. And this was supported by the advice from the, the, the central legal team at, at Church House that an institutional collation of an incumbent needed to be in person, and also that the oaths and declaration of assent needed to be taken in the presence of the bishop, i.e. With, with the office holder being in the same physical place as the bishop in order to meet canonical requirements. So clearly there was a difference of debate, of opinion across, across the piece. And it caused quite a lot of concern, particularly amongst registrars, because different people were doing different things and no one was very clear on what was legal. So the matter was reviewed and discussed by a number of senior ecclesiastical lawyers. I recall a particular conversation in April with Peter Collier, who is our Vicar General in the Northern Province. Um, he referred to the court circular in the Times that week that reported that the Queen had held a Privy Council meeting via vi video link when she was at Windsor Castle and other members of the Council were present via video link at another location in central London. If this was good enough for the Privy Council, then it should be good enough for us. Peter and his counterpart in the Southern Promise, Province, Tim Bryden, discussed the issues with the diocesan chancellors and their deputies. They reviewed the law in detail, and they then discussed the matter further with um, myself, John Rees, Alex McGregor from Church House. Um, eventually, all were persuaded of a common view, and in April 2020, we issued some guidance. We clarified that institutions and inductions should not take place whilst churches remain closed, but that it was possible to license clergy as priests in charge or as, or as curates during the lockdown. What we said in our advice was as follows. In the case of priests in charge and curates, it is the grant of the license under the bishop's seal which confers authority on the minister concerned. Bishops will need to find means of complying with the canonical requirement for the taking of oaths and the making of the declaration of assent by those who are to be licensed. We consider that if the oaths and declaration are dealt with by a virtual means valid. However, bishops might appoint a suitable person who can be physically present where the oaths are taken and the declaration made to act as the bishop's commissary for this purpose. There is nothing in the canons to exclude the possibility of that person being an adult member of the household of the person being licensed. I've never actually dealt with, with the latter option of using a commissary. Most of the ones we've dealt with in York have been, um, have been via Zoom, and I think that's been the case generally across the country. Another issue that arose at this time was that of how PCC meetings could be held during lockdown. The legal office referred to the requirement in rule M27-4 of the church representation rules that business at a PCC meeting is decided by a majority of members present in voting. The view was that there was a requirement for PCC members to be physically present at the meeting at which they were voting. The Vicars General disagreed. Their view was that the purpose of the phrase present in voting related to whether the required number of people had voted in favour of a proposal at a meeting. The distinction was between a requirement that, for example, two thirds of the membership had voted in favour, as opposed to two thirds of those present and voting at the meeting. 
The proper approach in the view of the Vicars General was to consider the place at which the meeting was held. Rule M23-4 of the CRR made it clear that the PCC or its chair may direct the place at which the PCC meeting is to be held. The argument runs that the PCC chair could direct that the meeting take place in a digital place such as by Zoom platform. The argument is supported by a 1990 Chancery case called Bing and London Life Assurance, in which Lord Justice Brown Wilkinson said, the rationale behind the requirement for meetings in the Companies Act 1985 is that the members shall be able to attend in person so as to debate and vote on matters affecting the company. Until recently, this could only be achieved by everyone being physically present in the same room face to face. Given modern technology, technological advances, the same result can now be achieved without all the members coming face to face. Without being physically in the same room, they can be electronically in each other's presence so as to hear and be heard and to be seen, at, to see and be seen. This interpretation has been accepted by the Charity Commission since as long ago as 2012, provided the charity's governing document does not specifically prohibit meetings by conducted by electronic means. In the event, our guidance issued in April was that PCC meetings could be held virtually if members could see and hear each other during the meeting, typically by video link. A direction of the virtual place of the meeting would have to be given by the PCC chair. Fortunately, the new church representation rooms had, rules had come into force at the beginning of the year and they included a new procedure, um, Rule M29, which enabled PCCs to conduct business by correspondence. The process is that the PCC chair instructs the secretary to send proposals requiring approval to PCC members, giving them a period of time in which any objections should be made and treating the proposals as having been approved in the event that insufficient objections were received within the time period stated. Reported at the PCC meeting. Helpfully, Rule 76 allows communication by email. So the recommendation was that if PCC meetings were held virtually, any formal resolution should be confirmed later by email using the correspondence process. It's quite interesting, whilst I've been preparing for this talk this afternoon, I've had an email from my vicar asking us to approve a, a, um, a decision by, by correspondence under the rules. I, I think it's being used quite a lot by PCCs now. As we progress through April, the next issue that tested the registrar's minds was that of the annual parochial church meeting. Um, the new CRR had come into force at the beginning of the year, as I've said, and they extended the time for holding APCMs to the 31st of May. Um, this was helpful and at first we thought this would give us sufficient comfort. However, as lockdown continued, um, we realised that it was unlikely to be able to hold the APCMs in time. We received, and the solution that was by them and that many dioceses adopted was for the diocesan bishop to issue an instrument under section 10 of the church warden's measure and rule 78 of the CRR, because of course an APCM usually includes the annual meeting um, for electing church wardens. Um, and that would extend the time for holding APCMs and the annual parishioners meeting, and also extend the date for the admission of church wardens. In many cases, this resolved the issue. However, some parishes did not hold their meetings during the summer months because, um, because of the holiday time, people were away. Um, although, of course, restrictions had been lifted at that time. Um, the issue then arose as to whether meetings could be held remotely because they hadn't held their meetings in time. We advised that a further bishop's instrument, instrument could be used to modify rules M1 to M12, allowing the APCM to be held remotely from different physical locations, providing that all those attending could see and be seen, hear and be heard. Again, the term being present was to include being present by electronic means. These are just some of the issues that we had to deal with, particularly during the first lockdown. Other problems did, of course, arise, 
for example, issues relating to marriage preliminaries. In fact, I've been advising on marriage preliminaries and the reading of bans again today. Um, all of those were resolved on an ad hoc basis as time progressed. To consecrations. My mother can't recognise me in that photo at all. <laughs> One of my main tasks as provincial registrar is to deal with the legalities for the consecration of new bishops in the northern province. I was due to attend my first consecration as provincial registrar on the 25th of March last year. This was to be the consecration of Sophie Jelly as the new Bishop of Doncaster. It was cancelled on the 18th of March due to increasing concerns about COVID-19. Um, of course, we then had the closure of churches on the 24th of March, so this could never have gone ahead in any event. However, for a number of practical reasons, it was important for Canon Jelly to take up a post quickly. And so in, the event, so in the event, a creative solution was reached, whereby the Bishop of Sheffield licensed her by Zoom as Bishop of Doncaster designate on the 25th of March. For some months, ordinations and consecrations, which required an act of public worship and the laying on of hands, could not proceed at all. In the event, the consecration of the Bishop of Doncaster took place on the morning of the 21st of September, with the consecration of the Bishop of Sherwood taking place during the afternoon. At this point, services of this type were limited to 30 attendees. I had previously attended consecrations at York Minster. Often, two or three bishops would be consecrated together, with a cast of dozens and a congregation of several hundred. The procession would include dozens of bishops, legal officers, the College of Canons of each relevant cathedral, and a whole host of interested clergy. In September, because we were limited to 30 attendees at each service, we had to hold two separate services so that each bishop elect could have their close family and friends in attendance. A consecration service requires the attendance of the provincial registrar to read out the Queen's letters patent, instructing the archbishop to perform the consecration. Usually this document is handwritten on vellum and and sealed by the Queen's seal. These documents could not be produced during lockdown, and so instead the Crown Office emailed me the letters patent that had been approved by the Queen. Not quite a showy a document, but legal nevertheless. The Archbishop must be accompanied by at least two other bishops who join in the laying of hands. Usually the service at York Minster involves a whole company of bishops, who surround the bishop designate at the point of consecration. Those within touching distance lay hands on the bishop designate and the others place their hands on the shoulder or arm of the nearest bishop, so that an episcopal human chain links back to the bishop designate. Clearly this was impossible in September 2020 and so in our pared down service the archbishop and two other bishops laid hands on the bishop designate jointly using copious amounts of hand sanitizer, both before and after the act of consecration. Of course, masks had to be worn at all times. Usually, the Archbishop anoints the new Bishop with oil, but this also was not possible. The staff at York Minster, however, searched the Minster Treasury and located an ancient silver anointing spoon with a long handle which enabled the Archbishop to pour the holy oil onto the new Bishop's head from an appropriate distance. Helen Rawson of York Minster gave me some of the history of the spoon. The spoon is silver with a whalebone handle and was made by Hampston and Prince of York in around 1790. It was originally used as a serving spoon, but is perfect for the socially distanced anointing of bishops. The spoon is part of the William Lee collection. From 1944 onwards, William Lee collected examples of early or rare York silver. The extensive collection was exhibited in the Undercroft of York Minster from 1972 and later donated to the Minster. We've used this, this spoon on, I think, three occasions now. We've had three consecrations since lockdown. As I've said, the service was pared down 
so there could be no communal singing, no sharing of the, of the peace, communion in one kind only, and no mingling before or after the service. Our next consecration was of Mark Rowe as the new Bishop of Berwick. This had been arranged for the 5th of January this year. On the previous Thursday, the Northeast was placed into tier four restrictions, which significantly limited the ability of individuals to travel away from their homes. Whilst the 30 attendee limit still applied to this service, many of those who had planned to attend decided to stay away given the new restrictions. However, matters moved on, as on the evening prior to the consecration, Boris Johnson announced a new lo national lockdown. Places of worship could this time remain open, with communal worship continuing. However, travel and other tighter restrictions were imposed. You can imagine me sitting watching Boris on the telly with my phone in front of me, waiting for the phone call or the email that would tell me what was happening. After several frantic phone calls and a review of the Minister's risk assessment document, it was decided that the consecration could still go ahead, but that Mark would be accompanied only by his immediate family of four. This is the most restricted ordination or consecration service that I have attended at the Minster. It was reduced to its most basic elements. However, it was nevertheless a very intimate and moving service. By the end of the service, there were more bishops in the Minster than there were in the congregation. We had the Archbishop, the Bishop of Newcastle, the Bishop of Chester, the Dean of York Minster, who is Bishop Jonathan Frost, and the newly consecrated Bishop of Berwick. I now want to talk about the confirmation of election of um, Stephen Cottrell. When I was appointed, as provincial registrar almost a year ago now, I was looking forward to giving my wig and gown a good airing at a plethora of events and to attending a lot of really excellent parties. Listed in my diary were Archbishop Sentimu's farewell weekend at the beginning of June, which would include the ordination of priests, a splendid farewell service and celebration, and his final act at Choral Evensong of laying down his crozier on the high altar at York Minster. The confirmation of election of the new Archbishop of York, which was due to take place at a service of evening prayer at York Minster immediately before the July General Synod meeting in York, to enable Archbishop Stephen to take a full part in General Synod proceedings. Archbishop Stephen's enthronement which was due to take place immediately after the July General Synod meeting, on the basis that most of the required attendees would already be in York. And various other events and parties to welcome Archbishop Stephen to the diocese and to the province. In the end, none of these events took place as originally intended. Certainly, my wig stayed in its box and there were no parties. The greatest challenge was ensuring that Archbishop Stephen could commence his ministry as the new Archbishop of York. The confirmation of election is a ceremony set in the context of court proceedings presided over in this case by the Archbishop of Canterbury. The proceedings are set out in the Appointment of Bishops Act 1533 and they required the Archbishop of Canterbury and a minimum of two other bishops to carry out the commission of the monarch to confirm that all of the appropriate steps in the appointment of the new Archbishop had been completed. As the court is the court of the Archbishop of Canterbury in this case, he had the authority to decide how the proceedings should take place. At the commencement of the first lockdown in March, I think that most people expected that after a couple of months life would return to normal and all of these events would go ahead. However, as time went on, one event after another was cancelled. One of the reasons for such a short vacancy in C and a swift enthronement was to enable Archbishop Stephen to attend the Lambeth Conference over the summer. This event was one of the first casualties of the pandemic 
followed soon afterwards by the cancellation of the physical General Synod meeting in York. It was still anticipated that the confirmation of election could proceed, but as a much smaller event. However, eventually it was agreed that even this service arranged for the 9th of July could not go ahead physically, even with restricted numbers. So, what to do? It was important for the ceremony to go ahead if at all possible. The country was in the midst of crisis and it was more important than ever to have Consequently, Peter Collier and Tim Bryden consulted on the matter. This is an extract from the opinion that they gave. The purpose of the confirmation is to confirm that all the steps that should have taken place have taken place and that the person confirmed is the right one. That can be achieved in a number of ways. Everyone who will be involved does know the identity of the current Bishop of Chelmsford and can recognise him when they see him. It will be possible to arrange that all the necessary documents refer to the person as the current Bishop of Chelmsford. The original, originals of all the documents can go in advance to the Archbishop of Canterbury and there is no reason why certified copies certified by the provincial registrar should not be provided to the other bishops in advance as well. The advocate and proctor acting respectively for the Archbishop designate and the College of Canons can have their lines adapted so as to explain as we go along the documents that have been sent to the commissioners. At the, at the conclusion, the Archbishop of Canterbury could ask over the link whether each of the others agrees with him that matters have been proved to their satisfaction. And when they affirm that that is the case, he can then read the sentence pronouncing that Bishop Stephen is now Archbishop of York. Stephen, in the course of the proceedings, can swear the oath of allegiance, which does not require subscription according to Canon C13. There is no canonical requirement for him to make the declaration of assent in the confirmation, but he's required to do so on his enthronement. So there is no bar that we can see to the confirmation of election taking place via such as Zoom. It could be live streamed and or recorded for public access and availability. And so it was that the ceremony set out in Henry VIII's 1533 Act of Parliament was translated into a live streamed Zoom meeting held on the 9th of July 2020. It might be helpful to explain at this stage what the confirmation of election ceremony entails. Probably the simplest way to do this is to refer to the introduction of the ceremony prepared by Peter Collier and read out by him as Vicar General of the Northern Province at the commencement of proceedings. <clears throat> there are three stages in the appointment of a bishop. The first is the selection. That process involved the Crown Nominations Commission, which, after consultation in the diocese and in the wider province of York, recommended that the Prime Minister should submit Stephen Cottrell's name to Her Majesty the Queen for appointment as the 98th Archbishop of York. The second stage involved the Queen giving permission to the College of Canons of the Cathedral to elect the next Archbishop of York and recommending to them the person they should elect. The Queen then, by her letters patent, commissioned the bishops who have come together today to confirm that election. The third stage is usually the enthronement of the Archbishop in the cathedral, which marks the effective commencement of the new ministry. In the present circumstances, that cannot take place, and the commencement of the new Archbishop's ministry will be marked in a video, which will be released at the conclusion of these proceedings. The act of confirmation involving the Archbishop of Canterbury and the other senior bishops from the provinces of both York and Canterbury reflects the fact that since at least the fourth century, it has been a fundamental principle that confirmation of an Episcopal election on behalf of the wider church is necessary. The act of confirmation is legally very important because it confers upon the Archbishop the spiritual jurisdiction over the diocese by committing to him the care, government and administration of the spirituals of the archbishopric. It is therefore the confirmation of the election which makes the archbishop elect into the archbishop of the diocese. The wording used in the process of confirmation has a long history. Before the 18th century, it was in Latin, 
but in about 1733, an English translation was introduced. Today, a somewhat modernized version is used, which has been adapted to deal with the restrictions that prevent us being together in one physical place. The Archbishop of Canterbury, along with other bishops, as commissioners of Her Majesty the Queen, the Supreme Governor of the Church of England, sitting as a court of law, have to decide whether the procedural steps have been properly carried out so that the election of the new Archbishop can be confirmed. In the unusual circumstances that have prevailed by reason of coronavirus, His Grace, having the conduct of the court within his discretion, has directed that the proceedings will take place through a video conferencing facility. To the extent that such a novel approach might raise questions of valid validity or identification, I can confirm that the Vicars General of both provinces, along with other senior legal officials in the Church of England, have expressed themselves satisfied that in these unique circumstances, this approach using electronic means to fulfil the requirements of the historic legislation is entirely appropriate. And I might add, the Archbishop-elect, who has been the Bishop of Chelmsford and before that the Bishop of Reading, is well known to all those taking part in these proceedings today. <clears throat> the provincial registrar in the ceremony was John Rees, the provincial registrar of Canterbury, because the court was presided over by the Archbishop of Canterbury. I therefore did not have an official role as provincial registrar, although there are two other legal roles in the ceremony. In this case, my role was advocate, introducing and identifying the Archbishop elect. The other legal role is that of proctor, whose role is to produce the various legal documents. This role was performed by Lionel Lennox, one of my predecessors as provincial registrar and also a lay canon of York Minster. The first stage was for the provincial registrar to read out, out the letters patent. This is a direction from the Queen to the commissioners to meet together to confirm the Archbishop's election. This ensures that the requirements of the 1533 Act are complied with. Then it was my role as advocate to introduce and identify the Archbishop-elect. The proctor proves to the commissioners that all the necessary procedures have been complied with and that no objection should be permitted to be heard. The Archbishop-elect then, then takes the oath of allegiance to the Queen in accordance with Canon C-13 and makes a declaration of assent in accordance with Canon C-15, ensuring that the advocate and provincial registrar are able to witness him over Zoom signing these documents. On the screen in the top left hand corner you can see him doing this, that's the act of him signing and he had to make sure that we could see that he was holding a real bible and after he'd signed the documents he had to hold them up on screen so that um, Lionel and I could, um, could confirm that, that they had actually been signed by him. Um, finally, the commissioners confirm to the Archbishop of Canterbury that they're satisfied, at which point the Archbishop reads out the, the decree of the court conferring upon the new Archbishop the spiritual jurisdiction of the diocese. Peter Collier worked closely with Vicki Johnson, the recently appointed canon presenter at York Minster, to prepare the liturgy for the service, which of course had to include the formal court proceedings, together with an address from the Archbishop of Canterbury and an act of worship. One thing that took a huge amount of time was rehearsing for the ceremony. Rehearsing the speaking parts was quite straightforward. What was more problematic were the technical rehearsals for the Zoom session, cutting from live to recorded sections, ensuring that everyone was familiar with Zoom and ironing out the technical glitches. The ceremony was live streamed on the day and all went as smoothly as it could. Perhaps the most moving part of the, of the proceedings was the reading of the charge to the new Archbishop, which took the form of a pre-recorded video played during the service. You can still see it on um, YouTube if you're interested. A range of people from across the Diocese and Province of York read out the various sections of the charge. Iconic images, including the Bishop of Newcastle pictured in front of the Angel of the North, and one of our General Synod representatives beneath the Humber Bridge were incorporated into the short video, at the end of which the Archbishop accepted his charge. 
One of the most poignant events of the year was the laying down of the crozier by Archbishop Sentinel on the 7th of June, marking the end of his ministry. He processed alone down the nave of an empty minster led by a sole verger and laid the silver crozier on the high altar witnessed only by his wife. In a reversal of this ceremony, on the afternoon of the confirmation of election, a small group of us att attended York Minster to witness the new 98th Archbishop collecting the crozier from the high altar. In a twist on the usual enthronement service, Archbishop Stephen banged on the inside of the west doors of the minister with the crozier, and as the great west doors were opened for him, he walked outside onto the minister steps, from where he blessed the city and province of York to the delight of the local press. Archbishop Stephen had to pay homage to Her Majesty the Queen before he could return to the House of Lords. Over the course of the summer, a number of different solutions were discussed. At one stage, the view was that Archbishop Stephen would have to travel to London and self-isolate for two weeks before attending in person before the Queen at Windsor Castle. However, in the event, the Queen herself simply asked why homage could not take place over Zoom. And so it was that the new Archbishop of York commenced his ministry following two virtual ceremonies. His enthronement took place in York Minster on the 18th of October at a socially distanced service of Evensong. I'm still hopeful that one day the restrictions will all melt away and we'll be able to have that big party to welcome our new Archbishop. <clears throat> a week later, several of the same participants participants took part in a second confirmation of election ceremony by Zoom, this time for Mark Tanner, the new Bishop of Chester. The time and work spent preparing for the previous week's ceremony paid off, and the event ran like clockwork. So just a few final reflections on my first year as Provincial Registrar. As I've described, my first year has been far from straightforward. I have been constantly surprised and delighted at the flexibility of the Church of England to discover new ways to minister, to worship, and of course, to resolve legal issues. Again and again, I've found myself going back to the basics of the canons, the legislation, the ordinal and the rubrics to work out what is actually required in any given situation. Purpose of, purpose of interpretation has been the order of the day. I am proud of what we have achieved as an organisation, whether it be my local clergy faithfully recording daily prayers for our parish, the many churches who've opened as food banks, the Bishop of London, London representing our interest to government, Salisbury Cathedral opening its doors as a vaccination centre, or a group of ecclesiastical lawyers working through the 16th century legislation to enable the commencement of Archbishop Stephen's new ministry. It should have been a year of parties. Instead, it has been a year of paring down. However, I believe that we have all learned something positive in the midst of the crisis. Thank you. Louise, are you able to uh, stop sharing your screen now? And we have a few moments for some questions. Thank you. Um, I've just had a look at the uh, questions in the chat room and thank you for uh, those who've submitted questions. There's still some time. Um, I, I was really interested by your point about um, interpretation and the challenges of interpretation just now, Louise. And you might reflect that as lawyers, we, we spend a lot of our time and, and, and it's a big part of our career inter interpreting things one way or another. Um, Virtual meetings and virtual services have become such a big part of what we do. Um, should the church be looking to not try and interpret on documents, but put in place much more by way of provision for meetings to take place at PCC level and all the way through uh, virtually, and, and, and also in a blended way where some attend in person and, and virtually. And, and also for services in the future, it, it, somebody's commented that that could just really reduce our carbon footprint, engage more people um, in so many different ways. It'd be interesting to have your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, 
it's interesting, isn't it? We've we've managed to do it um, with the legislation that we've got um, in in most cases. Um, so 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 the the CRR under the CRR we've got the ability to do it. I I would have thought that next time the CRR are revised and um, the church representation rules, these issues of um, PCC meetings and I, I suppose diocesan synod meetings, deanery synod meetings. And being held by by virtual means does need to be addressed so that we don't have to have um, bishops instruments every time that we want to change the rules. I think it's something we will need to look at. And um, of course, I mean, one of the concerns I've had as we've gone through this process is is the people who who don't have the ability to um, to join by Zoom. And um, the parish I live in has um, a large council estate where not everybody has 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 the ability to attend an APCM by Zoom, for example. So I think there are some some issues we have to be careful with. But I think I think it's something we will look at and be cognizant of when when legislation changes. Um, I think the other things we do need to think about are things like the um, the issue of um, our, our online services, which have gone very well, and I think a lot of churches will continue to run online services, and um, they're, they're they're finding a new audience. I I just interviewed um, for a new provincial registry clerk last week, um, and she'd moved to York recently and had at one mm -hmm. of our churches, which I thought was was really interesting. She'd never she'd never actually attended physically, um, but I think if we're going to look more at more online services we then need to start thinking about things like how do you read bands of marriage how do you prove that you've attended attended worship over the relevant period of time to be allowed to get married in church and those sorts of things but yes i mean i think i think the other thing that that the other thing i'm hoping we'll see is um using zoom meetings more when we can it must have saved the church of england an absolute fortune this year in um train travel and overnight accommodation for those of us who have to attend committee meetings in, in Westminster. I'd, uh, <laughs> I'd agree with that. I was due to visit some clients in Cornwall and uh, whilst it's a long way from uh, Sheffield to Cornwall, um, it's, a, it's a, a lovely long drive and plenty of time to listen to the radio and to, to take in the scenery when you get to the other end. Um, there was um, there's a bit of a chat in the chat room about bell ringers and having an ecclesiastical law society uh, bell ringing group, which um, I think is a thought we shouldn't forget. Um, very, happy, very happy to join it, but of course we're not allowed to ring bells at the moment because of social distancing rules. <laughs> yes, how we do that via Zoom is a whole different. <laughs> oh, there's, there's bell ringing by Zoom. You wouldn't believe it. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't surprise me. Um, a question about um, use of individual cups at uh, Holy Communion um, and um, whether that's just a sensible thing if this virus uh, stays with us for a while. Uh, and a question about whether you've been asked for an opinion on that. Me personally or the LAC? Uh, either, oh, right. maybe. Okay, right. <laughs> it was a Quite interestingly, it's a question that came up in our in our own parish um, because we had a reader who 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 was a Methodist and and who couldn't see an issue with using individual cups, and I had to point our vicar's attention to the LAC opinion. Um, I mean, the LAC opinion, if 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 you read it, and it is in the um, in fact the LAC opinion is available on the Church of England website because it's one of the more recent opinions. Um, it does go in great detail into the theology of of this issue and the importance of having a shared chalice. And I have to say, I, I, I mean, the opinion was written before, long before I became in, involved with the LAC, but I, I have to say, I agree with the opinion and um, I think it's important to have, to have a shared chalice. There are different ways that people are suggesting of trying to deal with it by consecrating the wine all at once in a chalice and then pouring it out into individual cups. I'm not convinced that any of the solutions that have been proposed so far are actually sensible from a risk and health and safety standpoint anyway. I think I think a vicar having to pour wine out into individual cups and then you've got the whole issue of how they're cleaned and sanitised before the next event, it, it concerns me and I'm, I'm comfortable with the approach we take at, at the moment of taking communion in one kind. But, I mean, it depends on the individual, doesn't it? A, a lot of people... Are very concerned about not being able to have 
have a shared chalice. And in fact, the Church of England has issued new guidance as to how, how a shared chalice can work um, using intinction by the priest. Um, so there are ways of doing it. Thank you. Uh, another question, which is maybe a, a more of a practical one, um, about your different roles, because you're also uh, the Dyson Ritual for York and for Soda and Man. Um, and you mentioned at the beginning, having been told at short notice you've got another committee that you're a member of, you need to attend. Um, how do you juggle all those things and how do you keep a clear mind on the different streams that are all happening at the same time? Yeah, OK. It's quite normal for the provincial registrar also to be the diocesan registrar where the province is, is located. So um, for many, many years, the diocesan registrar for York has also been the provincial registrar. Um, and that isn't too difficult to manage because, of course, your diocesan bishop is also the archbishop. You have the, the relationships um, at Bishop Thorpe Palace. Um, and, and it's more a question of, of saying, which hat have I got on today? You know, which... which, which which file am I am I working on today? Um, but I mean, you know, that that in itself isn't difficult because everybody knows who you are and what your lines and responsibilities are. Um, Soda and Man is something I've been doing. It, it was my first ecclesiastical appointment, and um, Soda and Man is the smallest diocese. So actually, um, the, there isn't a huge amount of work or a huge amount of overlap with Soda and Man. Um, Soda and Man has a different legislative system and not all of the mm -hmm. Church of England legislation applies in the same way. So actually it is a real intellectual feat being registrar of Soda and Man because I always have to sit down and say, what would I do here? Right, how is it different in Soda and Man and how do I separate those things out? Um, over the course of the last year, I haven't had to travel across or I haven't been able to travel to, to, um, to the Isle of Man to carry out my, my duties there. So admission of church wardens and attending ordinations and things like that. Um, so actually the demands on my time hasn't, haven't been as great as they usually are. I think it'll be interesting when things get back to normal, if they ever do, um, trying to juggle, juggle all of those as well. But I mean, you know, if, if it becomes impossible, it becomes impossible, and I have to find a solution to that by, I don't know, appointing a, a deputy or, or something along those lines. Um, but I mean, you know, a, a lot of people run more than one registry and and, and hold more than one office. Uh, Louise, you've taken us to the end of our time. <laughs> um, can I thank you, uh, and can I thank you on behalf of the uh, Ecclesiastical Law Society? There are plenty of people who have also said thank you in the chat. So your talk has been uh, interesting and uh, informative. Um, can I thank everyone else for joining us uh, this evening? Um, two just points of business before we finish. 96% of you said that you were members of the Ecclesiastical Law Society. That means at least 4% of you might not be. If you are still with us, then can I encourage you to go to the website and to consider joining? Um, I'd also consider, ask you to consider, whilst you're on the website, uh, to look at the future ELS events that are happening. Um, clearly, at this time, you, you, there's much more opportunity to uh, attend events in the uh, northern province and in uh, the Canterbury province. Um, but if you were minded to join us next time, then um, in the northern province, our next lecture is on Wednesday, the 21st of April. Um, where the worshipful John Bullimore, who I think is with us, Chancellor of the Diocese of Blackburn and Derby, will be speaking on best practices in the consistory court and other bits, some guidance from a retiring Chancellor. So I'm sure we will all look forward to that. Um, in the meantime, I will wish you um, much safety and good health. And uh, thank you for joining us this evening. <laughs>